What's the tea of today, you might ask? Uh, this one is, uh, well, it's not technically tea. It's a uh, roasted dandelion root. It's, um, I haven't had it in a while. I can't remember how to describe the flavor. I'll let you know though. Oh, my cat is having a big old stretch. She's all stretched out on the floor, marinating in the sun. I love her. All right. Green was really from St. Louis. He wanted to return home with cash, which he'd swindled from Tiny Paul through a fake bootlegging scheme. Green had hired me, thinking I could gum up the works, get in the way of the police and the mob discovering the truth. Unfortunately for him, I'd been quicker off the mark than he'd thought. I was going to meet with Shipman to spring my own trap. It seemed I needed to make my way to this back to the station. See you, Frankie. So what's the news on green? Oh, right. I remember I gave him, okay. Give him a Southern voice. So what's the news on green? Frankie asked as I was headed up the stairs. Now it seemed like I had all the details. I summarized it for him. So the total wrap. Green isn't really green at all. He's Breg the Jester, a former member of Egan's Rats from St. Louis. I think we already read this. So he'll do it again here? That's right. His plan is similar to his last one, hire detective. Frankie looked at me with a blank stare. Seems like all the pieces fit, he said. So he just hired you as cover, I sighed. Seems like it. Don't worry about that. Frankie started saying, but I cut him off. I'm going to see Shipman now. I'll sweep you. I'll sweep away this mess, then come back and see you. Have a stiff drink ready. I instructed. Just be careful, Malone. Egan's rats have a reputation. They can be ruthless. I turned and walked up the stairs. There's only one place to go. The police station. Green had hired me to cover so that he could blow town. Shipman held the final evidence to sink that plan. I needed to get back to the station. car noises. <laughs> My old man! I'm just, this is, I, I enjoy doing voices. It's fun. I've got myself all giddy. I stepped into the taxi cab and was consumed with my own thoughts about the case. I'd finally caught my break, but it was a dud. I, didn't f I hadn't realized it, but I'd been re reveling in real detective work. Once I learned it was all bunk, my mind reverted into its incessant nagging. Hmm. I wondered if I was just a puppet to some two-bit mobster. I was hardly bringing much justice to anybody, which made me unsure of what exactly it was that I was doing. I supposed I was wasting my, wasting my time. It all came back to the same basic premise. You're failing, my inner voice said. I began to feel nauseous in the car. My mind repeated its last thought. You are failing. Aw, Malone. That's so sad. Oh. And then everything turned black. As if someone had shut off all the lights. My naked arms faded into view. They emitted a soft white glow. <laughs> Just flap them around. Oh, dear. I waved them in front of me, leaving streaks in my vision. Between the streaks, it appeared in the distance. Uh, I could hardly see, but as the object billowed, a clarity came to me. Then I understood what it was. Lewis's gray coat. Uh, Mrs. Green? I floated towards it. I reached to grab the coat which was when I saw the needles. No, not needles, glass. Shards falling all around me. One piece wedged itself deep in my right elbow. <laughs> One piece wedged itself deep in my right elbow. I grimaced, but I was unable to make any noise or movements. But then, as, sun as, as suddenly as the rain had started, it stopped. I looked upward with caution, wary of the rain's return, but above me I saw the gray coat, 
It was no longer billowing. It was rigid, a shield against the terrible rain. It started falling slowly at first, but quickly it gained speed. It came upon me and enveloped me completely. It was suffocating. I couldn't breathe. I let out a gasp. And then, the light. That's a lot of cyan. It pierced my eye sockets, hitting the back of my skull like a hammer on the anvil. I directed all my energy into my lungs and forced out a yell. That helped. Everything became quiet. Be everything became quiet. I could breathe deeply. I noticed someone beside me. He gradually came into focus. Shipman showed his teeth in a big smile. Uh, what just happened? I thought we got in a car crash, but... Why is he smiling at us? Uh, I looked up at him from my laying position on the Murphy bed. He swung his leg over a car and sat beside he swung his leg over a chair and sat beside me. <laughs> a long leg, just launching himself over a whole car anyway. Um, I thought, you... thought you'd never come around, he said. I tried to ask him something, but another bolt of pain raced up my elbow. All I, c all I managed was a groan. Relax, PC, just a few scratches. Quite the auto crash flew straight through the front window. They took out a large piece of glass from your right arm. I remembered none of that. I mumbled the words auto crash to myself. I wondered how bad the accident must have been. Shipman removed a flask from his pocket, unscrewed the top, and handed it to me. Not the best, Hooch, but it might get rid of that banging in your head. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> Um, aren't you a cop? <laughs> I shook my head, which was slowly clearing. I felt whiskey would only make it worse. My thoughts were coming back on their own. I got that modern intellect that you probably <laughs> shouldn't drink alcohol while you're uh, recovering from a head injury. I went to give the flask back to Shipman, but he put out a hand to stop me. Hang on to it. Might change your mind after what I'm about to tell you. I don't trust him anymore. Like, I'm worried it's drugged or something. I propped myself up on my left shoulder to listen. About Green's case. The two of us figured he was going to fake his own death. I feel like I'm Mulan doing Ping's voice. <laughs> Shipman clicked his tongue to his teeth and looked towards the floor. Who's saying this? Oh, him. That ain't happening! Last night, Carner Green was shot through the heart twice. What? I shouted. The exclamation was impulsive. I swung my legs quickly around and sat on the edge of the bed. My headache was sudden had suddenly vanished. See? That wouldn't have happened if we drank the whiskey! Whoa there! Shipman said. Look! Been here with you all night, he added quickly, in that chair beside the bed. Just telephoned the station to check in, and that's the rap they gave me. Told them what I'd known from you, and they said they'd chase it up. How did you did you how do you know it was him? Another involuntary question. I was running on instinct. PC, faking your death involves a mangled body, shot through the chest. His face is still intact. Whatever Green was planning on doing, he didn't get that far. And we looked it up. He doesn't have a twin. That would be too easy. Shipman grinned. Green hired you for this case, he continued. Gives you every right to follow it up if you want. That said, he was likely taking you for a ride. Wouldn't blame him if you want to drop it. Wouldn't blame you if you want to drop it. But I'd like your help, PC. You know the case. Could use your head, even if it's a little bumped. Once you're feeling better, I'll be at the station. Come find me there. I hate his voice. I'm so sorry. 
Shipman stood up and cracked his back. Maybe I'll catch some shut-eye on top of my desk, too. <laughs> sure beats that chair you got. He turned and walked out. I stood up from the creaking bed and surveyed the cluttered apartment. Oh, hey! <gasps> my cat! Look at the kitty cat! The cat slept at the foot of the bed. I scratched behind his ear, and he seemed to like that. Oh. I stared at the doorway and took a deep breath. I supposed I owed Shipman enough to help solve the case, even if Green had given me the runaround. After all, what type of detective would leave a case half solved? Let's go. There's only one place to go, the police station. Although Green had just been using me, his life had apparently been in danger all along. I resolved to find his killer. I headed to the North Beach station for any information Shipman could give me before starting the chase. What, what else would I do? Let's go. My cabbie! I gave my address and slouched in the back seat of the taxi cab. I thought a good way to pass the journey might be to chat with the driver. I asked him how he liked driving a taxi cab. It's all right, he said. Pays the bills, I suppose. But these things have two wheels too many. You like motorcycles better? I asked. He smiled. You've never ridden one, huh? I wouldn't ask if you had. I... I know poet. Can't tell you why it's such a riot, but it's a tonic to the rest of life, sister. He described the smell of the open air, the forest roads, and the sandy beaches on the road from Oakland to Santa Cruz. Got a cheap Motel H right now, but I need one of them new R32s. Made by a German group who used to make airplanes. Those babies are so fast they might as well fly. His eyes still held a twinkle as I left the taxi cab at my destination. A headquarters building dominated the corner of Kearney and Washington in Chinatown. Rebuilt after the 1906 earthquake, I thought it looked even more sour than it had before. I stepped out of the taxi cab and walked through the station doors, ready to chase any leads on Green. But standing in front of me as I entered, bawling her eyes from their sockets, was Mrs. Green. She saw me and brought her wailing closer. Malone, she exhaled through her sobbing. You were working for my husband. What happened? Her breathing obscured her next sentences, but I got the general idea. Now that we know she's from St. Louis, I'll try to... You will no longer hear my awful... Uh, Brooklyn accent, and will now hear my awful St. Louis accent. Uh, I told her I knew as little about the matter as she did, but that I was looking into it, and I was sure the officers were doing their best. She begged me to help them, again drowning most of her sentences with her sobbing. I promised I would try. She took a slow inhale, raised her chest, and walked out of the station. Oh, well, good for you. You don't have to hear me do that voice anymore. Oh, we have someone new. When she was out of sight, Fred Grant came around the corner and let out a snort. Grant was another investigator for the SFPD. I studied his ruddy face, strewn with broken capillaries that it uh, oh, I think it's strewn with so many broken capillaries that it gave the impression of a map of streams. A cigar often poked through his mouth, hardening his jaw and twisting his face into a scowl. I suppose that was an appropriate look for a man who enjoyed his bribes in liquid form. Grant had never been a supporter of police women, and he was no fan of mine. He lit the cigar and said, The world seems pretty torn up about him. You're really helping her out? It wasn't his place to know, so I just stared at him. All right, if he ain't hell going to talk, I should be on my way. Got last thing I gotta do is add you a tin spoon and toss this in the freezer. That meant he was about to close the case cold. He smiled as though he was glad to do it. I raised a questioning brow. You aren't chasing it up? I asked. If you get a confession, we'll cop them. Not something the DA can so much knows that either. I got to admit three things. Means, how did I kill Green? 
opportunity when they did it. Motivation, why they'd bother. You do that, then sir, we'll be right behind you. But there ain't nobody here looking at that, I promise. He pulled on a cap and walked out. I hurled a glare in Grant's direction, and I was still fuming as I turned down the hallway towards Shipman's office. Shipman was frowning at the stacks of paper atop his desk, but he stood up and smiled when he saw me. Glad you made it. I vented about Grant. Shipman shook his head. I ain't wrong, you know. I must have scowled a mean look at him because he was quick to follow with, not that the case is dead, PC, but Captain has nobody on it. Even Grant's coming off as soon as he can. We're underwater with other bunk. So you have nothing for me? Not true. Department still did a regular foxtrot. He tossed a beige folder. Or he tossed me a beige folder. Inside was a large black and white photograph of Green's face. Muscles relaxed and eyes closed. It looked almost normal, apart from his flattened hat behind his head and the dirt and grass behind that. The report behind his picture noted three important clues. First, that Green died at midnight the previous night. I cursed myself that I'd been so close to stopping it. Second, that Green was killed with a with two 45 caliber bullets to the chest. Those slugs weren't from a pea shooter. Green was killed with by a mean gun. Finally, that Green was found this morning lying in Washington Square Park. That was only a block away from the Tin Spoon. I noted each of those facts and gl gave the folder back to Shipman. Sorry, <laughs> I'm having trouble reading this. The dark blue on darker blue is difficult to see with the uh, light coming in through my window. And I don't want to deprive myself of the sun just yet, so we're dealing with it. All we got, Shipman said, laying the folder back on his desk. Can pinch the gunman if you prove the case. But you gotta solve it without much support. Don't have time to help either, he sighed. No point coming back here until you've got your man. I never had much support from the department anyhow. Well, Shipman sighed, at least I'm for you. But listen, we need a confession on this one. Captain doesn't want to run around. Right. Grant mentioned they'd have to admit how, why, and when they killed Green. That's it. Prove that, we'll pick them up, he said. Never been on a murder before, right? Can get tense. Just know if you accuse someone but can't prove everything, they'll turn like a switch. Might like you one minute, but hate you the next. Chatting with your folks is your easiest route to more information, but won't get any banter after you accuse someone of murder. So be careful who you accuse. Could make your case harder if you go the wrong way. Well, alright, I get it, I said, and I internalized it. And remember, Shipman continued, plenty of lies out there. But you can contradict means, motive, or opportunity with anything in your notes. I thanked him and walked out of his office. I stood outside the police station and went over the mantra. Mantra? Mantra? Mantra. I had to prove the means, motive, and opportunity for anyone I suspected of the murder. Once I found all three for a single person, I'd have them licked. I started out to begin the chase.